All right, thank you. Uh, we're going to start for the, uh, the second panel, which is looking ahead. Uh, perilous territory, I think, but nevertheless. Um, we'll follow the same format as we did for the first panel, which is to say we'll have a Q&A after all three speakers are finished. Um, and chairing the panel today is uh, Barry Posen, who is Ford International Professor of Political Science at MIT and Director of the uh, Security Studies Program. Uh, he serves um, on the Executive Committee of Seminar 21. He's written uh, several books, including the most recent one, uh, a highly regarded Restraint, A New Foundation for U.S. Grand Strategy. Um, he has been as many of you know, one of the leading international relations theorists in the world, I guess, not just the country. That's an exaggeration. Yeah, that's an exaggeration? Okay. Just the United States. And uh, North America, maybe? Um, and so it's a great pleasure to have him chair, and he will introduce the panelists. Barry? Thank you. So good afternoon. Thanks for coming out. Uh, thank you, John, and to all of those who are worked to organize this panel, the panel this morning and the panelists um, today. Uh, we're uh, reflecting upon the 70 years of Israel's existence, um, both what it means for the state of Israel and what it means for the Palestinians who have been in conflict with the Israelis since uh, before the creation of the state. Um, uh, we're pleased to have uh, three speakers on this panel, and I will introduce them all at once. We all have long introductions. We all know who we are, but so I, I'm going to kind of take the liberty of economizing a little bit and just mention a few highlights, uh, and I'll talk about the order. Uh, first and not is to my right, not politically, but... Um, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, she's the Schweitz... Professor of Philosophy at the Kinnipiac University and was formerly Professor of Philosophy at Tel Aviv, from which she retired. She's held visiting positions in all kinds of really cool places, including the University of Bergen, which I kind of envy because Bergen is very cool. Uh, among her publications are Peaceless Reconciliation uh, in the book Justice, Responsibility, and Reconciliation in the Wake of Conflict. That's a Springer book from 2010. Um, she's worked with many different organizations in Israel, uh, and perhaps the one you may have heard of, um, most, most probably heard of, was she was chairperson of the board of B'Tselem, uh, the Israeli Information Center for Human Rights in the Occupied Territories, during the Second Intifada, 2001 to 2006, a um, very sad period. Uh, Ari Arnon is professor emeritus in the Department of Economics at Ben-Gurion University. He's been a visiting faculty and visiting scholar at Stanford and Berkeley and SOAS in London, the University of Pennsylvania. You get around uh, to good places. <laughs> He's worked as a senior economist in the research department of the Bank of Israel and as a consultant to the World Bank. Um, and he was a founder of the program on economics and society at the Van Leer Jerusalem Institute. Perhaps most interesting for this group is he's done a lot of research on the economics of the Palestinian-Israeli relationship and the Palestinian economy. Uh, and he's now the Israeli coordinator of something called the X Group, which is an independent Palestinian-Israeli and international think tank focused on writing about economic issues as they affect the Israeli-Palestinian um, conflict. And Final, finally, the la our last speaker will be Leila Farsak. She's associate professor and chair of political science at UMass Boston, so she's a neighbor. She's the author of Palestinian Labor Migration to Israel, Labor, Land, and Occupation in 2012. But she's published on many questions relating to the political economy of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, alternatives to partition, international migration, and a whole host of, of, of academic journals. Uh, and she's also worked for a number of international organizations, including the OECD. Uh, in 2001, she won the Peace and Justice Award from the Cambridge Peace Commission here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where we find <laughs> ourselves today. So without further ado, I will start with you and I. Whatever. Are you just going to start? Is oh, you want to start with Arnie? I thought you wanted to change it. I didn't want anything. No, <laughs> no I thought I not wanted it. I thought no, you I wanted thought to, go first. Go first. No, I thought you, no, we'll start with Arnie. That's fine. I was, I, I've received two different messages, right? <laughs> so, so we'll start with Arnie. That's fine. We'll start. <laughs> so <clears throat> first, uh, 
I'm very happy to be here and thank everybody who made it uh, possible. Uh, my first comment is really about uh, pessimism and optimism. In many of the discussions, certainly in the part of the world from which I usually come, which is the Middle East and Jerusalem, West Jerusalem, I should say, uh, pessimism is uh, among people who think more or less like I think is uh, the coin of the day, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy that it is not uh, so much so here. Uh, I don't feel this pessimism anymore. I think that the most important aspect of looking to the future, looking forward, prospects, is to find ways to return to a serious discussion of what is the political compromise between Israelis and Palestinians that can give us better results than the failures that we had faced over the last, let's say, 25 years since Oslo. And uh, uh, what I will uh, try to discuss in the next few minutes is to uh, outline what was missing from the agenda, especially on the Israeli side of the equation, uh, during those 25 years. Uh, <clears throat> because, because it's not obvious, but it is essential, that people will understand that we are talking about two. Two people, two nations, two sides, two whatever, but two. And it is not obvious on the Israeli side, and certainly it's rejected by the Israeli government today, that there are two equal sides, so to speak, with legitimate claims that should be answered in as much as possible symmetrical fashion, symmetrical arrangement. And this was not so in the past. Part of the collapse that we have heard about over previous discussion was that Oslo, <clears throat> when it started 25 years ago, was basically a ceasefire agreement. It was not an agreement about any contours of the permanent status. The permanent status was just listed there as problems to be solved. But nothing was said really about the solutions not to the settlements, not to the borders, not, not to Jerusalem, not the refugees, nothing. Uh, so much so that people will not remember, but when Rabin accepted the final versions of the Oslo agreements, he did not believe that there is nothing there even about the freezing of the settlements. He sent uh, someone, Ramon, to find that it is really so, that the other side ex agreed not to spell out uh, freeze on the settlements, for example, not to speak about the other issues. So, a compromise between the two is very difficult because the two sides, even those who supported a political compromise 25 years ago or 30 years ago, even those who supported it, have different narratives. We have heard about it implicitly or explicitly in the previous discussion as well. Uh, the, the, the historical description of what happened in Palestine, Israel, over the last 120 or 30 years is very different also among those who are the candidates for supporting a political compromise. Uh, 1970, 1929, 1936, 1948. You can, manage, you can, you can have a long list of debates about what happened. I'm not, going, I'm not going there because I don't have time. The, one of the basic, one of the basic important failures on the Israeli dovish, they, they call it left, but you can better call it dovish side of the equation, was that for most of them, the problem was 1967. As if the conflict started in 1967 and the solution 
is concerning 1967, basically land for peace if you want, 67 borders, or not exactly 67 borders, including 67 borders in Jerusalem, which was a big problem. All the other aspects of the conflict, mainly, not only, but mainly the refugees issue, the 1948 refugees, Palestinian refugees, was not part of the discourse of peace since 67. On the dovish side, of the Israeli society. This brought us, in my view, to Camp David, seven years after Oslo, with a conflict that was built in and was doomed to fail. Doomed to fail the negotiations. Because on the Israeli side, the preparations for a resolution of the refugees' problem from 48 was zero. Also mentally, thinking about it, think tanks, papers, understanding that it is important. For the Palestinians, it was essential. Half of the Palestinian population are defined as descendants belonging to, basically, refugees. So if we want to have a better start in the next round, we should have the two sides sharing the same set of problems that are to be resolved, including, most importantly, the refugees. I'm not saying it is easy. And on the refugees, of course, you have two different narratives on the two sides. But luckily for us, I think, going into a political compromise does not necessitate an agreement on the narratives. The two sides can keep their own narratives, go to the negotiations, and reach a political agreement on a compromise, and keep faith to those narratives they had. It is not essential. Uh, it will be good if the two sides can agree on the narratives. I don't think they can. And I don't think, luckily, that it is essential. So. If we start from uh, this point, then we really go back to defining the issues and the conflict in a way that will change it. It's not only 1967 that we are discussing. It is 1967 and 1948. And if you want, it's pre-48, 48, and post-48, and 67. It is the historical compromise that we have to reach. And to do this, we need to agree that the two, there are two sides and that they have their collective rights, not only individual rights. If that is my view, and I, am, I belong uh, to those who uh, came to the conclusion many years ago, too many years ago, that two states are the only framework that can solve the conflict between the two sides. It doesn't have to be 67. It has to be two states. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be a Jewish state. It can be a binational state. If you will ask me, it can be two binational states. I'm not sure the Palestinians will agree to it. But binationalism is not the problem here. The problem here is that on the two sides, one of the basic desires is to have self-determination. If you want to call it sovereignty, call it sovereignty. If you want to call it state, call it state. But this desire is fundamental, and you cannot bypass it. And this is difficult. It is a small land. You all know the territory is restricted. To have two states is not an easy uh, option. If I'll talk a little bit about the economics of the two states, uh, it is interesting to note that in 1947, when the partition plan 181 was passed in the UN, the two sides were supposed to live in what we call an economic union, in, in, in a, an economy that has no border, borders within it. There is a long appendix to the 181 decision that describes in details 
how uh, this union should work. It is more or less like the EU these days. Trade is open, labor flows inside, etc., etc. It is two states, if you want, with Jerusalem, as we have heard, as a separate uh, entity. And the two states are living within one economy. Since 1967, almost all the discussions about two-state solution went in another direction, including the X group that I belong to. All, I think, all the ideas about two states between Israel and Palestine went to the concept of two economies, two states, two economies. It has, a, it has good rationale behind it, I think. The gaps between the standards of living on the two sides, it is, since 67, 1 to 10, 1 to 12, uh, it, it is a huge gap, not as was the EU before it was created, which, where they had much more convergence in standards of living and sizes. It's, it's both the size of the economies, it's in fact 1 to 20, the sizes of the economy, and the standards of living are very different. To have the two societies after such a long and bitter war, hopefully we assume that there is an agreement on two states, living in a one state, one economy, or even in a two states, one economy, will bring with it huge parities that I think will be very difficult to handle. It is better for the two sides to have, at least for a while, maybe 10 years, maybe 20 years, maybe after a while, people will rediscuss it and decide that they want to have an integra integration process, like in the EU. But it is better <coughs> to live for a while in two economies with which it, each one has its own policies, trying to go on a path of convergence between the standards of living, on the standards of living between the two sides. So if, if, if we talk a little bit about the economic aspects, uh, <clears throat> then the question of borders between the two sides is important and was never discussed properly, although in 2000, when the, it's not the last, but the serious attempt to resolve the conflict and reach a permanent agreement, there were also discussions about the economics of the conflict. And in those discussions, it was clear that by 2000, opposite to what happened in the Oslo Agreement in 1993, the two sides were very close to a point where they agreed, in fact, they agreed already in principle, to have borders between the two states. It was, there was a failure. At the end, nothing happened. But the two sides' official uh, negotiations among the economists were very close to say, let's have what we call FTA. You know, uh, it, it's going back to concepts that we don't have time now to discuss, but uh, necessitate borders between the two sides. FTA is like NAFTA. It is, uh, exactly. it is the agreement that the two sides have their own trade policies to some extent, not fully, but to some extent. So let me conclude because time is running against us, against me especially. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> the Oslo process failed, no question about it. The failure was basically the collapse of Camp David. We have to understand the collapse of Camp David in the previous session. Some ideas were, I, I, I think it is still, uh, uh, lots of books and papers were written about it, but it is still a big question why exactly the two sides failed so, so badly in Camp David 2000. Because what we see today is the direct result of this failure. This failure was translated on the Israeli side to the no partner slogan. No partner slogan meaning that the Israeli government, the Labour government, Barak, came back from Camp David and said, I unmasked the other side, 
they don't want peace. And if you ask Israeli political system today, majority, center, right, and also part of the dovish side, do believe that Israel has no Jews in Israel, we should say. Mm -hmm. Don't have partner on the other side. To correct it, to change it, to make the historical compromise a possibility again, is the mission that we have to take upon ourselves. And uh, on this, I would say that if we look forward and we try to outline some changes, then the most important change is that there should be found Israelis and Palestinians who will start working again to legitimize a program, framework, political ideas that will be in line with we are two on this land, we, hunt, we have to find a political compromise that include, will include everything, the territory, Jerusalem, the refugees, and everything else, else, including the huge gaps we have in economics between us currently. Uh, this is not an easy uh, mission, but all other missions that uh, were proposed, one state, one man, one vote, etc., ignore the basic animosity between the two sides, the huge package they have on their backs uh, that they should deal with before entering and supporting with majority, not 100%, but at least 60%, a political compromise that is still, in my view, possible. 15 minutes passed. <laughs> Now, now it's your turn. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I always say that I love being after everybody because I want to answer everybody. I won't have time to answer everybody, but I think most of what I say is somehow a rejoinder to what Arya just said. Um, Ilana Harmerman wrote about uh, five years ago, there can be no genuine discussion here about the present and the future without a discussion about the past, and that's all we had, I thought, the, uh, the panel about the past. But I really think that you can't talk about the past or the present, or the future, unrelated to the others. There's, there is a ball here that is so um, intertwined that we can't just say, oh, here's where we're going uh, when we look at the future. On the other hand, I think that uh, what I will say about the future is that big elephant in the room that Salim brought up, and I thought, oh, there goes my elephant. And that was, of course, the one state idea, solution, concept. I don't like the OSS, one state solution, label. <laughs> but, but I do like um, thinking about the idea of one state. And I don't expect for this to be a debate right now between us. But I want to uh, tell the story of the idea of one state and try to show that given where we are now and given where we've come from, it is actually the way to go or the only viable way to go. Um, th there is a very uh, almost personal story of those of us who were one-staters, then became two-staters, then adopted again the one-state uh, thought. And the story is very um, chronologically clear. I think until about 73, there were groups who talked about one democratic state for all the people or peoples living in uh, Israel-Palestine. And I remember in around 1973, the argument that was thrown back at people who believed in some sort of vision of one state, democratic one state, uh, what was thrown at us was that if 99% of the Jews want a Jewish state and 99% of the Palestinians want a Palestinian state, then who are we to say to them, uh, what, what, what is our authority, moral or otherwise, definitely political, to say to them, oh, you have to live together and I'll be uh, democratic together. And it is about that point that the two state ideas started being bandied about and then well articulated. I, I want to remi remind everyone that uh, Golda Meir was still on record as saying there is no such thing as a Palestinian nation or a Palestinian people. So it was, in the 70s, considered radical to recognize Palestinians as a nation and to say that there should be 
a Palestinian state. It wasn't a conventional foregone conclusion at all. Uh, I think the first time that it came out in Israel really explicitly was in 1988 in the elections when Hadash, the communist, Jewish Arab Communist Party, used that as their slogans for elections. They said, two states for two peoples. So this is 1988. It's not such an old idea to talk about two states for two peoples. And it became the rallying cry of the left, of the doves um, in Israeli society, who were not as weak then or as minuscule as they are now. <laughs> so that was the two-state idea, the two-state uh, program that was later, and I find that fascinating, actually, that was later adopted by the whole world. It didn't come from the world originally. It was then adopted. Um, and I would say it's what we've been talking about when we talk about peace negotiations. That whole idea of negotiations has been based on the two-state idea since, definitely since 1993 with Oslo, and I would say till maybe today. And that is what I want to be a little skeptical about. Now, in the last 25 years since Oslo, definitely since 2000, what we're hearing, what we've been hearing more and more loudly, is the assessment of people who travel the land, the assessment of people who go to the West Bank, who talk to people on the West Bank, who see what is happening on the West Bank. And I'll say a little more later about Palestinians living inside Israel. But the main uh, phenomenon that we're seeing when you travel the West Bank is that, con that idea that there is nowhere you can draw that line. There's nowhere where you can see a border between Israel and Palestine if you were to go that way of uh, the two-state solution. So the chronology is very clear. First, the ideology of one state, then a two-state idea that takes over as an ideology and a practical negotiation um, for, format for many years. And I might have said 25 years, probably 10, 15 years, where we're hearing the two-state solution is no longer possible. I call that my superficial story. And what I want to do is problematize it. I want to say that even though that is the story of how a lot of us experienced the politics that was going on, uh, we have to think about things a little differently. So here's another little vignette. 10 years ago, almost 10 years ago, I was at a conference at Tufts. I don't remember what it was about. I do remember people on the panel. I will not mention their names right now. Uh, it was about Israel-Palestine. And I asked, in general, the panel, I said, what you guys are talking about is actually one state, at which point a person who is an expert in Israel studies and security studies said to me, there is no chance for a one-state solution because 99, again, that 99, 99% of Israelis refuse to accept it. And that, that speaks to your idea of compromise. If at least one group that we know of is all unanimously against that one state, then how can you even think of it as a goal, an objective in any sense? Um, because his point was, a solution has to be acceptable to both. And the thought that I had then was, why is it 99%? And is it really 99%? This is 10 years ago. Um, I did ask someone else at a different point, suppose 99% of Israelis, and I am speaking here from the Israeli perspective. I should have said that right from the beginning. Um, suppose 99% of Israelis do not want to accept that idea of one state. Um, what do we do with that type of group unanimity? And someone else at another conference once said to me, when have you ever heard of the privileged group giving up on their privilege with no resistance or protest? And I take that very much to heart. I don't exactly know why compromise means what we have taken it to mean. If a privileged group is in the wrong, why do we need to compromise? I admit to coming from philosophy, I worry about concepts, in particular the concept of compromise. All right. So the question is then, 
why is the idea of one state so unimaginable? Mm. Why has it become a pie in the sky for some people and something that can hardly been, be investigated by, call them realists, perhaps? And I think there are two arguments that one can find here. One I would call the Jewish state argument, and the other I would call the separation argument. I think that what, what Arya was talking about was the separation argument, so I'll get to that in a minute. The Jewish state argument, of course, is based on Zionism, on the idea that Jews make up a nation, a people, not necessarily a religion, and that the self-determination of a people, what you have called collective rights, must, be, must consist of sovereignty and a state. We all know that is the nation state format of how the world works. So if this is um, Zionism, by giving up the idea of a Jewish state and saying this will be one democratic state, you've basically given up on Zionism. Israelis, again, not 99%, but very many of them think of themselves as Zionists. And therefore, accepting the one state solution means defaulting on a Jewish state. I didn't say Jewish rights. I didn't say Jewish culture, Jewish tradition, Jewish beliefs, Jewish togetherness, Jewish family, Jewish state. If you accept a one state solution, you default on the Jewish state. The second argument is the separation argument. I think it's less principled, less nuanced, more instinctual, even though I'm not blaming you at, for being less nuanced, less principled, or <laughs> less instinct, more instinctual. But the, the separation arguments argument looks at the history that we just heard last time is about 150 years history, a history of conflict, and says that these two peoples cannot live together. You must separate, given the facts on the ground of this conflict, of the animosity. Uh, we don't have time here to go into the history. I just want to mention Ariela Azulay, who just recently found in the basements of some ministry in Jerusalem, a hundred contracts or agreements written between Israeli towns and kibbutzim on the one side and Palestinian villages on the other in 1947 and 48, telling each other, promising each other that they would not attack each other. We were never taught that. We were never told that. Nobody ever talks about that. And of course, if you dig into the history, you can hear all sorts of stories about Jews and Palestinians living together in that small area. So I beg to merely be very skeptical about that argument that says we must separate because we cannot live together. But those are basically the two arguments that come out against the one state solution. One, if you are a one state or you're anti-Zionist, the other, uh, if you're a one state or you're leave, living in dreams, thinking that the peop these two peoples can live together. What I want to then say is that perception and conception go together. These are myths promulgated by media, by education, by the way we talk, by our language, and by the communities in which we live in Israel. Of course, some of it carries on into America as well. Uh, I think that that truism that 99% of the Israeli Jews object to the idea of one state is no longer true. And I think it's no longer true for very good reason. I love telling these stories because people have written and said things that are so fascinating. There is a wonderful political scientist called Meron Benvenisti. Benvenisti, I think he was here too. I think he was in our Jerusalem project here, actually. Meron Benvenisti in 1969-70 wrote that there's no going back from the 67 lines. He said there's no going back to the 67 lines. He said that Quote, this country is a shared land, a single homeland. He's a wonderful writer, and he was always there a beacon, but a very solitary beacon. He was on his own. He was what we always used to call the radical left. And we all knew that if you wanted to hear something about one state, you go to Maron, because he also knows the history. He knows how to analyze these things. This was in 1969 that he wrote these things. It took. 30, no, where are we? 50, almost 50 years. In 2010, he wrote another book. He's written 
many books, by the way. He wrote in 76, Jerusalem, The Torn City. West Bank Data Project was a big project that he had. Conflicts and Contradictions in 88. And my favorite was called Intimate Enemies, Jews and Arabs in a Shared Land. This is 1995. In 2010 or so, he put out his last book. And then in 2012, he was interviewed in Haaretz. Granted, a leftist newspaper, but definitely as leftist as the New York Times. Um, <laughs> and he was interviewed on the cover of the magazine talking about one state. And those of us who had so often talked about one state said, this is interesting. He is given the cover of the weekend magazine. Something was going on there. And the fact that this is a subject that can be talked about that is not put on the side just for the weirdos to deal with. I would say that since 2010, the number of articles on the option of one state has mushroomed. In 2013, Guidon Levy, granted a radical dove, radical leftist, wrote an article called Time to be Single-Minded. Right? And Guidon was mourning the fact that the two-state solution is over. This is not a matter of just driving around the West Bank, which he does often, of course. It was an analysis of how two states are no longer possible for many reasons. And he was explaining how we can and must live on that one land. I just want to quote something very short. He said, if you will it, it is no dream. One just state for two peoples. The establishment of a Jewish state was perceived as something no less crazy less than 100 years ago. Subversive? The establishment of a Palestinian state was considered no less subversive even less than three decades ago. So yes, these dreams have become fact. He went on to explain that we are living in one state, but it's not a just state, and there's no equality in it. That piece made a lot of noise. A lot of people reacted, a lot of people responded, a lot of people talked about it. And less than a year later, Guidon wrote another article, Who's Afraid of the Binational State? I wrote him an email saying, how did you go from mourning the two-state option to being so happy about the one-state option. And he wrote, quote, I'm so enthusiastic about being liberated from the nonsense of the past. All right. So what I'm trying to say, basically, is that Israelis are thinking about this. This is not one group only. I want to, and we might later have a chance to uh, disagree with Steve, who said that that numbers have been consistent in, in, um, in the polls. They haven't been consistent. The two-state solution used to be, as you say, 60. In 2007, it is now less than half uh, for both group. Forget about, for a moment, Palestinians. I'm, I cannot speak for them. For Israeli Jews, it is less than 50% now. The idea of one state in the polling has gone up to 13, 14, 15%. I'm not talking about annexationists who want one state of a different sort. So I do want to finish with two points, and I will try to make them as short as possible. The main, the main, I don't want to say attack on me, but the main um, critique, thank you for the word, <laughs> the main critique um, that I have heard was an article and, and I think we heard that somewhat from Salim today, but it was an article by Asaf Khoury, who wrote something called, an article called One State or Two State, A Sterile Debate on False Alternatives. And Khoury's point was that we are all just talking. We talk about one state, we talk about two state, we talk about these utopian visions. And his point was that we have to worry much more right now about the hardships, that was the word he used, the hardships that Palestinians are undergoing right now. And when he wrote this in 2007, the hardships were the wall, the roads, and the settlements. Well, what I want to say is that we've lost the wall, we've lost the settlements, we've lost 
the roads, the way the land looks now, those are things that we can no longer fight about. What can we fight about? Human rights, equal rights for Palestinians and Israelis. A wonderful friend of ours called Ronnie Talmor, who was uh, very prescient in 1984, she said, this is one state. There is one sovereign power here from the river to the sea. She said, it's just an apartheid state. I want to say, it's not just, it's not equality. The label of apartheid is a different discussion. If you want to say apartheid, fine. Whatever it is, it is one state in the sense of having one controlling sovereign power over it. And the point is to fight only on the level of human rights for Palestinians. And that can be done given facts on the ground and given a change in Israeli conceptions only in one state. And I'll end with, um, with the words of another journalist, poet, Yitzhak Lao, who wrote about Meron ben Benisti's article, who argued with him, who thought that one state would actually perpetuate Jewish hegemony and colonialism, which was weird. But he ended his article, and that's how I want to end my words, quote, do I support, support Meron ben Benisti's binational state position? Yes. Do I support two states for two peoples? Yes. Do I support a state of all its citizens? Yes. Which is most preferable, whichever comes first? Thank you. So I suppose it's me. OK. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and it's really a real challenge that uh, I'm the last one to speak, and I'm now, now the one who's supposed to give you some optimism after what we've heard in the earlier panel and what has been said here, especially that we're having a, an interesting Israeli debate that now the Palestinian will try to resolve, <laughs> which puts you, which, which in a sense is emblematic of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Uh, what I would like to do in the 15 minutes we have is really two things. Uh, I'd like to, a little bit, I was hoping that earlier panel would say, what is it that we achieved over the past 70 years? And where can we go ahead um, now that we are in this reality? And I think Salim did a very good job in explaining. We are very clear about what Israel achieved. Israel achieved a lot. It's strong, steady, it has what it wants. Uh, we don't need to go over that. But I think it's useful to just do a little bit of a reminder, what did the Palestinian achieve? And how can they go forward? That's what I can talk about. Because I think what has been expressed before, there's still some optimism that the two-state solution can go ahead. It is the only game in town. Uh, how can we make it happen? Uh, we have two views here. So one saying, well, we have to make it happen by revisiting 48 rather than negating 48. Whereas um, Anad clearly says, well, no, we need to think something different. And I'm of the opinion that definitely what the legacy of the past 50, 70 years and also 25 years of peace process, which we should not ignore, is precisely that we are back at the drawing board. But we cannot start drawing a new solution before understanding what has been achieved and why the two-state solution is dead or why there is no option or possibility for reviving it. Because I think it's easier to say that we are the two-state solution is dead than saying that we are in a one, we have a one-state solution. We are in a one-state reality. But defining a one-state solution is much harder because it involves addressing fundamental questions that two parties do not want to address, and which are much, much harder to address and easier to handle in a two-state solution. So what has been achieved from a Palestinian point of view? I think from a Palestinian view, point of view, we should not forget that there are three major achievements that have been obtained over the past 70 years. First of all, I think very important to remember that it is no min minor achievement that the Palestinians resurrected themselves from oblivion, which the 1948 war inflicted on them, to asserting themselves to exist as a people with a right to self-determination, not just with human rights. The big problem of 48 and above all UN Resolution 242 of 50 years ago, 51 years ago, was precisely that it locked the Palestinians in a problem that they are a, humanita a humanitarian problem that needs a humanitarian solution rather than a political problem that needs a political solution. And the importance of the Palestinian struggle over the past 50 years is precisely how they reasserted the Palestinian right to self-determination, 
which came to be defined not simply as return, but gradually, and this is a second achievement, how the Palestinian national movement shifted from defining its project as the libera liberation of all Palestine to coming to terms with the fact that the only option in town is a two-state solution, because we have UN resolution to endorse it, above all 181, but also 242 insinuates it. And also came around to accept that a Palestinian state on part of Palestine is better than no state. So it opted for the state option, precisely because having a state is the only way how to have rights. So although it will not provide full justice, although it cannot uh, um, provide a um, solution to the Nakba, it can provide citizen rights, it can provide some return, it can provide protection from foreign intervention, it affirms the equality of Palestinian rights with Israeli right to self-determination. And that's a major achievement, uh, which was very costly. Uh, and thirdly, I think the Palestinian acquired an international recognition of the right as people and of the right as a state, which is no minor achievement today. People do not know that, but 20 years ago, 30 years ago, it was still very difficult in the United States to talk about the Palestinians. They were still terrorists 30 years ago. In this institution, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, you could not talk about Palestine the way we're talking about it here. So that's a major achievement. Everybody is aware, uh, including the Israelis, that there is something called the Palestinian people. There is something called Palestinian rights. These rights are not just humanitarian rights, but also political rights. And fourthly, I suppose what is very important with Oslo, and this is the major thing about Oslo, is that it provided the first Israeli recognition, Israeli official recognition of the existence of the Palestinian people, and that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict need to be resolved with the Palestinians rather than with the Jordanian, or the Arabs, and they were not Arabs. And, and as my Israeli friends know very well, there was not the word Palestinian in the Hebrew in a dictionary before 1993. After 1993, we discovered that there is something called Palestinians. So it's not minor. So if all these have been achieved, if we've achieved Palestinians resurrected themselves from the death, everybody recognizes the right to a state, we have an international recognition of the importance of a Palestinian state to solve the Arab-Israeli conflict, which is with the roadmap. We have today a recognition of a Palestinian state as a non-member state in the United Nations. Uh, everybody is trying to push for this two-state solution. And we even have the Israeli recognize the idea of a, they're not against the Palestinian, idea of a Palestinian state within condition. But here I would like to remind everybody that Israeli, since the occupation of 1967, have already tossed with the idea of a Palestinian state. They've been talking about the Palestinian state. They first proposed it in 1967, soon after the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza, and it was rejected because the Palestinians did not want to be, have, uh, be, you know, uh, have a state which was empty of any sovereignty. But the idea of a Palestinian state that can be controlled by Israeli was always there. So if we look now, though, at where we are today as today, that is in 2018, one would argue, yeah, we achieved lots of uh, recognition. We have an international commitment to a two-state solution. Uh, we have all the infrastructure for a two-state solution. We have international legal endorsement of the two-state solution, but we don't have any political will from the international community or from the Israeli side to impose a two-state solution. And the question is, why isn't there no will, or, does it, or is it futile to ask why there is no will? Because I think if we look at the past, if 18 years since also, the past 25 years, what has happened is that also did not end the occupation, also basically redefined Israeli colonization. It did not end it, it redefined it and created an apartheid reality, as you can say from this map. I don't think Israel has ever wanted to create an apartheid reality. It ended up creating it because it, could, it wanted the land without the people, but there was no, no, there was no place to get rid of the Palestinian people. So this apartheid reality leads us to the reality that we are now in a one-state reality. You want to call it apartheid, you want to don't call it apartheid, but de facto what we have on the ground today is a one-state reality, which has been said by different people, in which Israel is the dominant sovereign between the river and the sea, and in which Israeli have full rights, and the Palestinians nicely fragmented in, by Israel into three different categories. We have the siege in Gaza, since 11 years, which is unacceptable, but it's been going on for 11 years, and where humanitarian conditions, let alone political rights, are being daily violated, as you can see on every Friday demonstration. We have 
a divided Palestinian leadership. We have a West Bank, which is fragmented, as you see up, up there. And we have the Palestinian citizens of Israel, who definitely have more rights. But we basically started having three different populations under Israeli control who have different sets of rights and, and privileges or not privileges. And in a sense, one could argue that despite the great achievement that the Palestinians achieved, Palestinian situation today could be argued to be worse than it was in 1948, precisely because of the regional situation. Because of what's happening in Syria, what's happening in Yemen, what's happening in, in Egypt, the Palestinian catastrophe, uh, unlike 1948, uh, is not jolting the Middle East into big changes as happened after 48. We actually see the Palestinian cause forgotten because there are much more serious problems, one would argue, in the Middle East today, whether it is Syria or Iraq or, or, or Yemen. And there's, at the same time, much more acceptance of Israel regionally than it was in 48 or 67. And we can see the latest with the Saudi uh, Israel uh, rapprochement. So what does this tell us? How can we go forward? Okay. Uh, I believe going forward, it is clear that we are in a one-state reality. And despite all the support for a two-state solution, we don't have the will to impose a two-state. And I'm not too sure. It has to do with the extremists. We can debate that. Steve mentioned that there is extremists who, who violated, um, who made the reaching compromise much more difficult. All our studies of the past negotiations reveal, even by Israeli uh, acknowledgment, that what has made any negotiation fail, including the latest Olmert negotiation, Olmert Abbas negotiation in 2008, has been Israeli intransigence, has not been Palestinian. Palestinians have been very compromising. It was the Israeli intransigence because of the, I don't know if we would call it the influence of the right, but the fact of the matter is that we have today in the West Bank 500,000 settlers that, if you want to remove them, as you can see up there, it's going to lead to a fragmented Palestinian state. So how can we get, so we are in an apartheid reality. How can we bypass it? And I think what this tells us is that moving forward, it is clear that the experience of 25 years of negotiation and 70 years of Palestinian, uh, 70 years of Nakba, or Israel's creation, is that, as Ari said, the two people need to find a way to live together. And that this ideal two-state solution that could have been implemented has not been implemented. And while this apartheid reality looks very grim, I think this apartheid reality both hold some very pessimistic outlook, but also can provide some opportunities. The pessimistic side of the present reality can, lies in the fact that this can endure for some time still to come, because Israel is not forced into any compromise. Okay? Israel is quite strong. The Middle East is very weak. The Palestinians are very weak. This apartheid reality can continue for some, some time. But on the positive side, the fact of the matter is that today, between the river and the sea, there is equal number of Jews and Palestinians. And when you start talking about 6 million, 6.4 million Jews who have full freedom, right, political and economic and human rights versus 6.4 Palestinians who have fragmented, if no rights, this is a situation which is not attainable, especially if you take into consideration what has happening and has been happening in Gaza, which shows you a whole new generation now has grown up in the West Bank and Gaza. Who knows only Oslo, and very soon also only siege. And their discourse and their aspiration is completely different from a state. The Palestinian state project, in my view, has achieved its mission. It's, it asserted the existence of the Palestinian as a nation as, and people with rights. But its role for the Palestinian people is over. And the, night, the question of the challenge for the Palestinians is to try and think, how can they redefine the Palestinian, the national project? And that's the big challenge, because nobody is interested in this debate, because it's a very difficult debate. It's a very difficult debate, both for Palestinians and Israelis, because they have to address the place and the role of the other in their community. It poses on them two difficult tasks. In other words, the task facing us ahead, the drawing board we are at, OK, now. Both nations exist. Both people exist. Both cannot eliminate each other. Moving forward, though, two things need to happen, in my view. First we need to redefine the relationship between territory, sovereignty, and boundaries. This is something the Israeli right is happy to talk about, because it's a way by which it maintains Israeli sovereignty. But they also admit that there are such things called Palestinian people that need some rights. They cannot deny it. The Israeli right is aware of it. They're trying just to dilute the notion of right and take the collective rights. But the second and more difficult question is to address 
what is the place of the other and what right does the other have in each one's space or vis-a-vis -vis each other. And this means that you need to talk, do two conversations which are very difficult. On the Israeli side, I think what needs to happen, the Israelis need to address what can be defined as the Arab question and which entails accepting Israel's responsibility towards the Nakba, something Israelis are still have big difficulty admitting or dealing with, uh, rather than excuse the Nakba because of the Holocaust. It also implies that Israelis need to face the challenge that Israel cannot be both Jewish and democratic. Uh, and that's also very difficult. Uh, it's also a difficult conversation to have because Israel needs also to look at um, what has happened also to the Arab and Palestinian as well as Arab of, uh, Jews of Arab descent. This is a difficult conversation to have because uh, Israel, it, it requires that Israelis undo the colonial and orientalist foundation of Zionism. And this is difficult because Zionism has always defined itself as a civilizing a project that seeks to universalize the Jew, including the Arab Jew, rather than a, a be in a, a admit the Arab dimension of Jewishness, if I can say. This is something that many Israelis find very provocative if I talk about the Arab Jewishness or, or the Arab dimension of Jewishness. But I think it's something that needs to be addressed, especially in view of the, the majority, the over half of the Israelis are of Arab descent. The other question, though, for the Palestinians, and I'm about to finish, the Palestinian challenge is to address what can be defined as a Jewish question, which namely is Jewish attachment to Palestine and needing to face that Zionism's outcome is not only colonialism. This does not mean that Palestinians can accept Zionism or give up dismantling Israel's colonial structure. Uh, but they do need to explain how to decolonize Israel without negating the collective rights of Jews and the cultural identity that they have formed over the past 70 years. This implies, in other words, that Palestinians cannot just simply take out the, the democratic state project of 1971 and assume that every Jew is allowed to be in the state so long as he becomes an Arab of some sort. This, in other words, entails that both Israelis and Palestinians need to redefine the, their state and prioritize their political rights over national rights and also think of identity in a much more cosmopolitan or much more uh, multiple dimension rather in a unitarian and locked uh, identity. I'll stop at there. I'm sure you have lots of questions. Uh, what to do there? Do we, do we have someone manning or personing the mics? Yes. Uh, and uh, do someone we have woman. questioners yet? Uh, Okay, um, shall we move to the floor? Uh, hi, Ori from Harvard again. <laughs> um, I would like to open the discussion a bit because there is kind of um, setting either one state solution, which I can say that only the hyper nationalist far right and the hyper globalist utopian far left seem to agree is a viable solution, and the rest think is a delusional vision of the future, especially if you include the refugees that you want to send back to Israel, hence the Jews become a minority, and we know how minorities are doing well in the Middle East. So I am part of the 99%. Um, but the bilateral two-state solution is also not really working. Uh, even the moderates like Mahmoud Abbas and Salam Fayyad can't get it to work in 2008, mostly again because of the right of return of the Palestinian refugees. Now, there is a new kind of twist to uh, a, a solution, mostly based on regional solution, mostly because the holy sites and the refugee questions have to be resolved on the regional level. On, let's say Saudi Arabia and uh, the Hashemite Kingdom will not just let the holy sites be decided by the Palestinians and the Israelis. So the question is, do you see some regional solution, either as a confederacy or a two-state enabled solution by the regional powers in the near future. Thank you. Uh, you want me to address it? You want me to address it? Uh, yeah. I, I, thank you for bringing this up. But I'm really very fascinated by why you put the blame on the Palestinians for the failure of the two-state solution. I mean, I mean, how do you explain this map? This is not a map that the Palestinians created. It's a map that Israel, yes, I'm talking to you, is a, is a map that Israeli created. Uh, so, I mean, if you think that the right of return, we know today by Israeli historian and Israeli 
scholars, including Gershon Shafir, who's not considered to be very much on the left or anyway, not very much on the right, but he's shown very clearly that it's Israeli intransigence in his view because of the settlement movement. So I think you can go on and blame, yeah, it's the Palestinians, they did not accept. The problem is that you have, they have had the best government with Mahmoud Abbas, who have done the biggest compromise ever in the history of the Palestinians. And despite that, there was no peace agreement signed. Now, the point is, you, we, we can always get, get continue in that exercise, but this just keeps us in the same problem. It's because Israel needs the security, Israel cannot trust the Palestinians, this is why it needs to expand, because there are also there's land. I mean, this just is a recipe for prolonging uh, the reality further. Now, as to regard to the regional solution, I mean, yeah, one could argue now that there are regional solution. Saudi Arabia is befriending uh, Israel. Uh, uh, Saudi Arabia argues that Iran is much more of a threat than Israel is. Uh, but the Jordanians are not very eager to take the Palestinians and consider this a, a solution. I mean, the Israelis have always been in favor of a Jordanian option. Uh, ever since 1967, we have the Jordanian option on the table, and it has been rejected. Now, what would make it work now? The Jordanians have no incentive to take it. So I just wanted to put out that. I don't know if anybody... Right. Can, I, can I just add to that? Um, I love the way uh, facts are bandied about again as if they are facts. Um, and you said only a crazy bunch on the right and another weird bunch on the left. We have polls. That's the one thing that we can work on. Those are as scientific as one can get in a place perhaps like MIT. Um, and what we're showing is 15% of, as you call it, the right wing, 15, sorry, 15% 15 of the Israeli popu Jewish populace think that annexation is the way to go. That's, that's not a tiny bit. And 13% of Israeli Jews, the different 13%, say that a one state is um, a possibility, a good possibility. That's not something that is absolutely uh, you know, un, unworthy of being treated as a real group. That's, that's as you talk about facts. Um, what we also have, and I think Arya can talk to that even more than I can, are groups working together now of Israelis and Palestinians, not just the, uh, the ex group, but we have, I know, of three or four big groups thinking of how to do this given the changes in the environment in the Middle East in general. But these are groups of Israeli Palestinian, Israelis, Palestinians working together to figure out the more concrete structural steps of these solutions. So th there is something to work on and with. Oh, okay. I, so do, we're not going to turn this into a complete uh, debate. Yeah. We want to give other people a chance. It doesn't mean you wouldn't get another bite at the apple later if we run out of people. <laughs> Right, you might get another bite of the apple. We should give other people a chance. <laughs> Hi, my name is Susan Podziba. I'm director of the Sacred Lands Project here at MIT. And I actually worked with Marone Benvenisti some 30 years ago when I was a graduate student here. <laughs> um, from my reading, there's been a lot of assessment of the failure of Camp David because of the failure to have suggestions about the sacred esplanade, the holy basin of Jerusalem. And when I listened to the left, I find there's very little thought given to the religion dimension of the dispute. And so I'm wondering how you integrate thoughts of the rise of the religion dimension in the, in, of the dispute into your thinking. Thank you. This is, this is not uh, an easy issue by any means, certainly to people who consider themselves to come from a non-religious perspective. That is, and the, the, the truth is that the strength of, uh, in politics, in, in, in opinion politics, if you want, both on the Israeli side and on the Palestinians, of uh, Jewish political thinking and Jewish political powers. Jewish in the, t in the sense of religious, religious powers and religious thinking. 
is, is there and also, of course, on the Palestinian side. One cannot uh, and should not ignore the fact that uh, Hamas won the election in 2006. It's not uh, something invented or <coughs> fought or something. Uh, the, the answer, if you go back to any kind of a political compromise between the two sides, you'll, you'll face it. I mean, uh, the most difficult issue from this point of view is in Jerusalem, in Haram al-Sharif or Temple Mount or whatever, Harabite if you want it in Hebrew. Uh, it is a serious problem. Now, if people want to quote the negotiations that uh, Olmert, before he went to jail, had with uh, Abbas, uh, on this point, they reached an agreement. Uh, uh, it, is, it is well known that they reached an agreement that was, uh, if you want, a position that was uh, pro-Arab, pro-Muslim, or pro-Palestinian, because it was a committee of five that was to decide the arrangements on, the, on this sacred area. Uh, so not everything with Olmat Abbas ended up badly. And if you will talk about the refugees and go back to their negotiations, it also went a long way uh, towards But Again, like in Taba, almost, almost uh, symmetrical re situation there. Uh, Abbas was asked to sign an agreement without maps with a person who was on the way to jail, turned out to be, who was retiring. It was not clear what will happen to him. But part of it, is the very, you know, someone asked before if it is possible to impose arrangement on the Palestinian side. It's also a question who represent and can impose an, an arrangement on the Israeli side. It, 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 is, it is a political question that is uh, for both sides. So I would say, first you are right, it is more important than in 40 years ago, 50 years ago, to answer these, uh, these issues, but it is not that it is impossible. I, 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 if it is impossible, if, if you'll come, if we'll de develop the, the discussion and we'll say there is no compromise between the, re between the religious powers on the Jewish side and the Muslim side, it means basically under the current conditions that there is no compromise possible between the two sides. End game, and then you go to other directions, not a political compromise, but who, is, who will win, how the war will look like, et cetera, et cetera. Not very promising discussion. Anyway, I'll stop here. It's 4.30. Can we keep going a bit? Huh? Michelle? Yeah, OK. All right, well, we'll keep going, maybe 15 more minutes. Two more minutes, yeah. OK, good. Give some of the I other have a question questions. Here. OK, good. So my big concern, and I worry about a lot, is that the right will get stronger and stronger and stronger, and one day I will end up facing an expulsion of the Palestinians. Mm. Am I worried about nothing? Oh, the Palestinians or the Israelis? No. No, no I, will say, I will try to answer you and say you have, a very, you, you have to worry. I have to worry. They have to worry. Yeah. Because if you, someone said it before that the, I prefer the word status quo than the one state reality. Because it's not really one state reality. It is a status quo in the sense that the Israeli government managed to keep it as is, meaning that they control the area and they don't let the Palestinians participate in the political process. No right to vote, no influence. They are under their control. So you ask, what is their strategy? Do they believe that forever, 50 years, 51 years, maybe another 50 years, 51 years, they will keep it as is? The only rational answer for this is that they dream, and sometimes they talk among themselves when, the, when you cannot record it, that the only solution, solution uh, to speak about it uh, is, 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 is uh, to repeat the Nakba. Uh, that is, the big mistake of 67 for them was that it was not 48. Mm. So you should worry, uh, and I should worry. 
and whether they can do it or not under the modern circumstances of the political world, international political world is, 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 some people say it is impossible to do it these days. I wouldn't count on it under war mm. conditions. Can I just go? But um, this is a pessimistic uh, point of view. Yeah. And, uh, you wish so to add something? I, I, I wish to add more, I do, more pessimism. Because I also wish to add so something. So maybe you'll so bring please, in some optimism. So, no, okay. I, I will bring in some, but not much. Okay. So, um, so I, I, we've, we've been throwing around this word pes pessimism and optimism. And I go farther than pessimism. I go to despair. I think there's nothing more despairing than the status quo. And I don't care if we, what we call it. The status quo is something that Israel has been very good in for so many years. I think the people who tell you this can't go on, it has to explode or implode or something has to happen, Israel has been very adept at keeping the status quo going. And what we are hearing, I don't know if it's the past half year or a year, are people talking about a new Nakba. They do say it out loud. It is at least in places where we can hear it, some of us may hear it, and, and um, if they don't say Nakba, they say ethnic cleansing, or they'll say we'll make it miserable enough for the Palestinians that they'll leave. All right, and that is something that is often heard. Again, in those, um, in those polls that I read uh, voraciously, the polls have a certain percentage of Israelis saying that's what we need to do. Uh, so again, the, the weighing of the numbers is not the important part here for me. For me, it is the despair that this is happening. And I do just want to say that the only thing that, and, and, and I relate here to what Leila said, the only thing that keeps the despair at bay now are the new generations of people who are thinking of these things so differently. They're not even thinking under one state, two state. It's not, it's not those kinds of titles and logos. They are really thinking, there are new generations of activists and thinkers who are not as jaded as we are, if that's the one word we can say. And, and just to continue yeah. on your point, I, I think, yeah, that can happen. But I, I think Israel has a bet, much better solution right now. You have the, the siege in Gaza, which with which you remind the, the West Bankers, if you don't like it and you don't cooperate, you can get a reality like Gaza. So you have the five-star prison West Bank and the miserable uh, uh, prison of Gaza. But what is alarming for Israel is the fact that the Palestinians, going back to, to Steve, have embarked over the past, I would say, seven years, and we see it again in Gaza, on a nonviolent resistance. And this is something Israel does not like, because it's very difficult to tell, you know, to convince people that what Israel are doing, they're, they're putting human shields when they are just burning tires and, and trying, and, and they reconnected with the right of return. I mean, how, put yourself in the place of an Israeli. You, you, you expelled them, you imprisoned them, and they're still talking about right of return, and they're still going to, to Gaza, to the, to, the, to the checkpoint in Erez, and trying to, uh, to, to assert this right of return. It means that it's a, they are not going anywhere. So, and even if you put them in buses, Egypt will not take them, Jordan will not take them. So it's, it's a situation which is not attainable, but what is on the positive side is that it precisely people are redefining the struggle. Palestinians right now, like the rest also of the Middle East, they're talking about rights. Give me my rights. I want the freedom to see the sea. I want the freedom to move. I want the freedom of equality, which is bringing it back to like the African-American struggle in the United States. Now, this doesn't mean that we are in it. it what it means is that we are in a new reality that is, is being formed, a new language that is being created. Nobody thought in 1967 that you would have the PLO recognized after only six years after 67. Who would have thought in that depth of despair that something would come out? Now, do we know it? No. But do we know what are the parameters of the discussions? I think we know it quite well. And I think Israel is aware, if you put half a million settlers in the West Bank and Gaza, the majority of which moved during a peace process, your intention is to dis dis dismantle the Palestinians, fragment the Palestinians. And this is what happened. But despite this fragmentation, they're still struggling. So I mean, I, I, I don't know how you're going to square it. Uh, <laughs> but I think that's also what's annoying the, the Israeli government, but that's another. I was, I play, I play games with numbers sometimes, uh, the arithmetic of passing time to try and get perspective on things. And uh, I think six, if the occupation goes on six more years, Israel will have sat on the West Bank for three times as long as it didn't. Right? Three times as long as it didn't. It is more natural to Israelis to govern this space and to have it for their own security purposes than it is not. In one year, right? 51, three yeah. times 17. Yes, right. Now, yeah. second, and, and this is a, 
it, 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 perhaps a, 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 a shock, uh, given the tenor of the panel, um, panels, um, the reason we're having this conversation is because Israel is an extremely successful state. It's a successful war machine. It's a successful economic machine. It's a successful draw of immigration, right? It's a very, very successful state. It faces many of the other problems that modern capitalist states are facing, you know, inequality of distribution of wealth and other things, right? But it's, it's a pretty impressive achievement. And the people who run that place, they're awfully confident folk, right? And they've overcome a lot of obstacles, right? So the, these are not folk who are going to look at this and say, we can't sustain this. They're going to look at this and say, sure, we can sustain this. We could sustain this for a long, long time, right? So I don't, you know, getting back to the question that prompted all of these disquisitions, which is the question of expulsion, right? I, I don't, I know this language turns, turns up in Israel. Israel's not under much pressure to engage in expulsion. Yeah. The second thing is it doesn't, if you think the Israelis are still a bit cagey, right? Expulsion works politically in the world under conditions of, chaos, under conditions of external invasion, under conditions of great, of, of great fog of war. This is what made the expulsions in the 48 war possible and made them in some, uh, here I, I don't want to make anyone angry, but in a very crude and strange sense legitimate, right? Mm -hmm. Now, there's good things that it happened in the region that make this less likely, and there's bad things that have happened in the region that may make it more likely. The good things that make it less likely is there is no Arab, there's no plausible military front of Arab states against Israel right now. Iraq has no force projection capability. They can barely take care of themselves. The Syrian military is crushed. The Egyptian military is busy having un lack of success suppressing uh, al-Qaeda and al-Qaeda lookalikes, right? There's a Shia Sunni civil war inside the Arab world, right? Where is the war that would create both the, pr the pressures and the camouflage to engage in an activity like expulsion? Now, on the bad side is the Iranian presence in Syria and the Iranian relationship with Hezbollah. And if this goes very badly, it's possible that you could end up in, with quite an intense little war going on. And if that war were going on, and if some Palestinians made the wrong choice during that war, which they have done under, in other wars, right, you could create the circumstances, and I'm not sure it would be mass expulsion, but certainly for some not very pleasant things to happen. I, I'm going to take some questions over. Why, why don't we try, and we're going to have to go sometime. Let's try taking, say, three. OK. Um, hi, my name is Suri Bandler. I'm an MN student. I did my undergrad here as well, and I study computer science. Um, and in particular, I actually study how does a way a news article is presented impact the way that a reader understands it. So lots of things related to, to what I'm interested here. Um, but I noticed a thread among each of your presentations, which started with the idea, and I don't know. Professor Arnon, um, regarding this kind of issue of trust that exists between both sides and the need to fix that trust in order to develop a circumstance in which there can be any plausible solution, regardless of what that looks like. Um, and there are lots of things talked about, but one thing that I noticed that isn't talked about or are kind of hidden under assumptions or, or <laughs> side allegations in, in a lot of the discussion um, is kind of what's going on with the Palestinian leadership. Um, and um, okay. Mahmoud Abbas is presented as a moderate. And I would argue and push back that that's not, that's not accurate. Um, you know, we see um, when there's Jews who are praying on the Temple Mount, the allegation that, you know, they're filthying the, the you know, the, the Temple Mount with their, their dirty feet and any blood that, you know, is spilled for it will be purifying and whatnot. Um, and you see a lot of this, you know, kind of mirrored across a lot of his sentiment. And it, it also mirrored, in fact, in funding for terrorism for... Um, so and the question would be? So my question <laughs> is, so my question is basically taking in all of these threads that we kind of are jumping around or not focusing on. 
what is kind of the steps going forward in terms of, yes, we need to have responsibility and accountability and we need to fix trust. What steps do the Palestinian um, government and leadership need to, to kind of take, or whether that's from an externalization or an internalization process of it, but to kind of recognize the fact that there are big problems in the Palestinian government okay. and there's foundations for the lack of trust that need to be addressed um, regardless of how, quote, comfortable Israel is, is kind of presented as being. Um, Barry, we have to, that has to be the last what? question. We have three minutes to. Yeah, three minutes? So no more questions. No more questions. Okay, we've been given, we've been given a hard stopping time. The panel can respond to this question and do any kind of batting of cleanup that they would like to do on any other point that's been, one thing that's I, I think You get 60 seconds each, okay. apparently. Um, it's not a, you know, I think the Palestinian leadership has shown very great willingness to compromise, often uh, been described as uh, a traitor to the Palestinian cause. So I don't think the problem has been in the lack of Palestinian willingness to compromise. At least that's what the historical record shows. Uh, how, whether you have polarization of both sides, definitely. Uh, what is the cause of polarization? This we can, that's what we have been discussing and you can continue to read of. How are you gonna move forward? It's, you know, you, you cannot move forward if you live in this, in, with this reality. Uh, it's an oppressive reality which is not, is not, does not favor compromise. It favors more antagonism. It's just on the Palestinian side, I find it quite impressive that over the past six years there has been a policy of nonviolent resistance, whether it is with the BDS movement or whether it is now in Gaza. And I think that's, that's something that, you know, indicates that there is a justice to the cause and also an awareness that Palestinians' willingness has never been to eliminate the Israelis as much as to have their basic rights protected. Can I add a word on trust? Because that's such an important thing. Uh, and, and you gave an example of, of one side of it. Uh, if, I, if I quoted things that uh, Israelis say or Jews say about what's going on in Harabait, you, you would get the opposite information, of course. But what I want to say about trust is, of all those polls that I mentioned uh, just a month ago, uh, this was two months or three months after Trump's announcement about Jerusalem and the embassy. Uh, the question that was asked, and it made some headlines in Israel, the a question that was asked was, can we trust one another? And interestingly, and I find this my only point of optimism for a moment, interestingly, Jews in Israel and Palestinians in the West Bank, because they were the ones who were being asked, have the exact level of mistrust of each other. All right, so that is... So there's an area of agreement. No, yeah. no, <laughs> there's, more, there's more than an area of agreement. The one group that says that they would trust and that they do trust the other group are the Palestinian citizens of Israel who say that they do trust. And I thought these are the, these are the people who are living together. They're the ones who you can... Pinpoint to pinpoint as those who are living, perhaps not in one state, but in a state where they have Jews and Palestinians working together, uh, engaging together, and they have the highest level of trust, as in like from 40 percent to 83 percent. It's not a little bit more, and I find that a point of great optimism. Ari, you get the last word if you want it. <laughs> always. always. <laughs> Well, first about Abu Mazen, you know, yeah. one has to say you can criticize him for many things if you want. But to, to say that he is not a moderate <laughs> is something that I find, you know, hard to believe. And where you got it exactly, I don't understand. Uh, there is nobody who over the last 25 years, 30 years, maybe more, was more moderate in terms of the conflict the, in the leadership than Abu Mazen. He, and I will not go on about it. Uh, we can discuss it later if you want. The, the balance of power inside the two societies is what will change the feasibility or unfeasibility, impossibility of having a political discussion. Meron Benbenisti, uh, whom I know and appreciate, argued that it is impossible to have an arrangement from the early 80s, when there were not so many settlers and the facts on the ground were not so many, 
And it was, uh, it was an idea, but it was not really because of the facts on the ground, but because he did not believe that the political forces will do what is necessary to do to implement a, an arrangement. And this is really the problem. Even today, with all the facts, 600,000 Israeli Jews live beyond the Green Line. It's true. Hundreds of kilometers of roads, etc., etc., etc. You can transform the situation on the ground and create an arrangement that will reflect two states. It has not to be exactly on the green line. It, uh, it, it has to change maybe some things, etc., etc. But this is not the problem. The problem is the will, the political will, the necessity that the two sides will feel to do it. You know, it's true that Israel doesn't feel today that it is obliged to do it because security is good. But Israelis know that they live, you know, there are six million Israeli Jews. And they live in a region that is boiling and is much bigger than them. And they know that if they, if they can have an arrangement that will solid, solidify, what do you say? Mm -hmm. The arrangement with Egypt and Jordan, mm -hmm. it can be only if they will have an arrangement with the Palestinians. So this brings back Abu Mazen, the moderate. And the Palestinians who want, for their reasons, to have an agreement with Israel. My final word. Well, we'll call that a note of optimism. Yeah. <laughs>